Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> the angel of the church of Pergamos. I believe that's where we are. Where are we? Uh, yeah. 217. There we go. We noticed last, not, well, I didn't teach last Sunday, but the Sunday before last. Um, how many of you enjoyed Brother Sam last week? That was a, that very eye opening. Um, I had a dream, and I don't, I'm not one of these who puts a lot of stock in dreams, but I had a dream that we went to India and I, I saw people just lying in filth and just awful, awful, terrible things that I saw in my dream. And I, there are, um, there's a class of religious people called the ascetics. And I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but uh, supposedly Buddha tried all these different things and to, to try to find enlightenment. But anyway, and asceticism was one of them. They believe that if you deny yourself every form of anything, food, water, they supposedly eat a grain of rice a day, drink a tablespoon of water a day, and that's it. And they let their hair grow out, matted, and it's just dis they, it's disgusting that, that when they get to a certain point that they will find enlightenment. I would call that death, but anyway, that's what they believe. And in my dream, these ascetics were doing all sorts of horrible things to themselves and to their bodies. And I won't describe them. Uh, in order, and they were just all over the place. And it was just like the most horrible place that you can imagine. Well, what Brother Sam described last Sunday morning, part of that was in my dream. And I'm just, I'm just going, it's true. Uh, when you serve 330 million gods, um, number one, these are not like our God. These are devils. And the blood sacrifices and everything, all of that is true. And it's a horrible place. Um, those people need Jesus in a bad, bad way. And I want you to continue to pray for him. Uh, Pastor Lordson Rock that we've had here at our church, who also ministers. He's from India and ministers among his people. And he finds that with the untouchables, you can you can reach them with the gospel because they have been rejected by everybody else in the world. And um, so anyway, uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse, uh, let's sort of get the, the gist of what God is saying here. In verse four, let's go back to verse 14 of Revelation 2. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That, of course, is the word of God. He will fight against them with the word of God. And the word of God always wins every fight that's put to it. Amen. Verse 17, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. We talked a little bit about that. Well, I give to eat of the hidden manna. We taught on manna. And we'll give him a white stone. We haven't touched on that yet. And in the stone, a new name written. We sort of were into the new name part of that uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, which no man knoweth, uh, saving he that receiveth it. And um, Genesis, uh, I went through some of the people that had name changes last week. We have Abram in Genesis 17 being changed from Abram to Abraham. Sarah 
or Sarai to Sarah, adding what amounts to the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter He. In our language, it would be H, but it's and it has a breath in it. It has the spirit in it. Uh, something you'll, if you know anything about Hebrew and Greek, Gary, you may have studied a little bit of this, the differences between Hebrew and Greek. Hebrew primarily is all consonants. And they had to add all these little markings, these little dots and things like that. Later on, and this is after Jesus, they added all these little dots and dashes to the letters to give them the vowels that they're supposed to have, okay? So Paul said that the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And when you think about the letter of the law written in Hebrew with all consonants, that means the mouth is stopped somehow, and there's no breath coming out of it. But when God changed it over to Greek, you have breath sounds in Greek. You actually have breath letters. You have vowels, just like in English, A-E-I-O-U. You have the breath added to the letter of the law. You have the spirit given. And that's what you have in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the fifth book of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts. It's when the spirit came down and entered in them. And that's, that's what I see in Genesis chapter 17. You have uh, Jacob. Jacob, whose name is now Israel. And what does Israel mean? It's up on the screen if you'll read it. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Israel, El, the name El is in there. God's name is in there. Like Michael, Michael and Israel and Elohim. You have God's name in there. He's added it to uh, to Jacob. Now Jacob has now become Israel because he wrestled with God. When you were lost in sins and you were wrestling, you were striving against God, but one day you decided rather than fight against God, you were going to fight for God and you prevailed and God blessed you and God changed you. He gave you a new nature, gave you a new duty in life, gave you a new reason to live. Amen. Genesis 35. Um, in fact, let's turn there. Let's get the co context of this. I like this. Turn to Genesis 35. Um, let's see here. Where can we pick this up at? Verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel. There's that L again, E-L, always means God. Beth means house of, so Beth-El means house of God. And they journeyed from Beth-El, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. Ephrath is Ephratha, Bethlehem Ephratha. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Think, anytime you see a woman travailing in the Bible, it's a prophetic picture of things that are to come. What was it that Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5? For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape. How many ladies here went into labor very suddenly without it being planned? And Doctors like it all planned out now. Doctors now don't like to be surprised, so they'll call you in and say, show up here at 630 We'll start giving you the medicine that will induce labor so that by 4.30 or at least by 3.30 you can have the baby and I can still go out and play nine holes of golf. Okay? Back in, back in your day it didn't. So you went into labor suddenly, right? Lisa did with Alicia. We were just sitting there watching TV and all of a sudden, boom, she gets, she gets up and runs. And I'm going, where are you going? Oh, no. Yeah, she's having the baby. So, uh, yeah, if, if you had a baby back before those days, you know what this is talking about. It just, boom, it happens. It hits hard. No warning, no advance, nothing. Boom, there's the labor. So anytime you see a woman in travail or the mentioning of a travailing woman, pay attention to that. It's in Isaiah 13. There's a prophecy against Babylon there. Um, 
And the story of the birth of Ichabod, um, who is it? Um, Phineas' wife travails. She's in birth and she travails, but she's giving birth not to a Christ figure. She's giving birth to an Antichrist type. Because that's what the, the name Ichabod means, the glory has departed. It's because the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, and that's why they called him that. And so anyway, uh, verse 16 again, They journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Verse 17, It came to pass when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul... To try telling a woman in labor to fear not. I have it on video. I tried telling Lisa to calm down. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. She said, this thing's coming out now. I said, calm down. And I went, oh my goodness. Hurry, nurse, hurry up, get in here. I did. That's on video. You're never going to see it, but it's on video. Uh, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Verse 18, it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. Think about that. That she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Yamin. Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow or of my travail. Ben-Yamin means what does anybody happen to know benjamin son of my right hand now contemplate that for a while where is jesus at right now he's at the right hand of the father he's a this is a type of the lord jesus christ at his coming but his father called him benjamin and rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. So his name is being changed, giving a new name, a new meaning to his life. Instead of him being the son of sorrow, now he's the son who is at his father's right hand. Uh, Acts chapter 13, turn there. Saul, this to me was always interesting. And I don't know how common it was for, for Jewish children who were of a particular tribe to be called a similar name. But King Saul in the Old Testament, the first king of Israel, Saul was his name. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And lo and behold, here is Saul, who later on is going to be called Paul. Here is Saul, who is also from the tribe of Benjamin. I always thought that was curious. That, that just gets my gears going. I'm wondering what's up with that. And it may be just a thing where... A lot of boys out of the tribe of Benjamin are called Saul. I don't know that. But to me, it's always interesting. We have one Saul, and here's one, one analogy I would make. We have one Saul in the Old Testament who started out good and turned bad. So bad that he ended up consulting with a familiar spirit. Here we have another Saul, same name, same tribe of Benjamin, who started out rotten, killing Christians, arresting them, having a zeal to gather up all the Christians that he could. He wanted to eradicate the name of Jesus, off the, wipe it off the face of the earth. How dare this man go against Moses? We have Saul who starts out a horrible person and ends up being, I'll say it, I think Paul was the number one best Christian ever. 
best evangelist, best teacher. The be he was given 14 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. The vast majority of the New Testament doctrines that we believe came from the mouth of Paul. And God gave him a new name in the, right at the beginning of his ministry. If you look in, um, let's pick it up in verse 4 of Acts 13. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. That also is interesting to me, as the name Jesus in it. And Bar is uh, like a prefix, sort of like Ben. Bar means of Jesus. Ben means like son of somebody, like Benjamin means son of the right hand. But he's a false prophet. He is a Jew. He's a sorcerer. And his name is Bar Jesus here, but he also has a different name. Which was, verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And I want, to, I want you to pay attention to this because there's a little mini lesson in here. Anytime you desire to hear the word of God, Hell is stirred up against you, is it not? Hell itself is stirred up against you, and it's going to try to prevail against you. There are things that devils don't want you to know. They don't want you to read them. They don't want you to find them out. They do not want you associated with this book. They fought against Jesus. They fought. You see Jezebel fighting against the word of God. Mystery Babylon. You see it all through the scriptures. The devil, first thing he does, is trying to destroy the power of the word of God. So here we have a man who desires to hear the word of God. But he has as one of his counselors a sorcerer. And that sorcerer is not going to go along with this. So verse 8, but Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. He has a different name also. Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Notice that he mentions in verse 7, he wants to hear the word of God. And in verse 8, it's the faith. The two always go hand in hand. You want more faith, then you need more word of God. Amen? And when you get more word of God in you, then you will have more faith. The two work hand in hand. And he said, then Saul... Now for the first time, boom, who is also called Paul. And from this point forward, he's never Saul again. From this point forward, he's never Saul again. I've told this story, I've given you this account, but it fits with this verse. When I grew up in this church, all we heard was, King James Bible. Whatever preacher preached behind the pulpit, it was a King James. The pastor that I had before I went to Bible college, I agreed 100% with him. King James is the Word of God. No errors, no mistakes, nothing. Then when I went to Bible college, the professors as well as the students See, I wanted to be popular. I wanted them to like me. And so when I kept saying King James, they kind of mocked me and scoffed and shunned me. And I didn't like that. So I changed my thinking and changed my position on that for that very reason. God let me wander in that wilderness for years. But when God brought me back, by his grace and I surrendered to it from that day forward I'm not going to be called Saul ever again I'm not going to go back to these other translations I'm not going back I'm I found it and that's it it's and you have that theme in the Bible of birth death rebirth and anything that God does 
for permanent, for keeps in your life is going to follow that thing. Once, when we get our new bodies, do we have to worry about getting COVID anymore? We get our new bodies, we won't have to worry about being sick, we won't have to worry about backaches, we won't have to worry about what, how much our medicine is going to cost, we won't have to worry about death, we won't have to worry about hell, we won't have to worry about anything. We're, once we get the new body, we're staying with it, amen. Never to turn back. And that's from this point forward. You can look. There's, Saul doesn't exist anymore. And um, there is a, a guy, he's, now, he's out of prison now. But he is sort of an uh, arch rival, I guess, of mine, a nemesis. Because uh, his name is Jim Staley. And he started making big noise with turning everybody to the Hebrew roots of the Bible. Instead of New Testament, he called it the renewed covenant, which basically meant the Old, the Old Testament all over again. He didn't call Paul the Apostle Paul. That's a Greek Gentile phrase. He called him Rav Shaul. Here's this little... Gentile guy using trying to use Hebrew words. He's not good at it. And he's calling him Rabbi Saul. Well, such things were prohibited. Jesus said, call no man your master. Don't call these guys rabbi. They're, they're not your master. You have one master, which is me. That's it. And so that's what he would do. He, would kept, he kept going back and calling Paul by his former name, Shaul or Saul. And that's not... From this point forward, he's never Saul again. He's Paul. And not too long after this, Paul doesn't even go back to the synagogues anymore. He says, I'm done. I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. They, they, they're not going to try to kill me every time I open my mouth. But anyway, then Saul, verse 9, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And he said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And then the deputy, when he saw that what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. What the devil tried to do with this man, Sergius Paulus, by prohibiting the word of God, all he did was it provoked God to show forth and manifest that his power truly is greater than the power of all the sorcerers put together. Somebody say amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when Sergius Paulus sees this, his, his right-hand man, his counselor, when he sees that here's this little guy named Paul, he ain't much to look at, but he just said to Bar-Jesus or Elimus, you're cursed, you child of the devil. You're going to walk around blind. And he walked out of that room blind, had to have people lead him out. Sergius Paulus goes... That's what I've been waiting. That's what I've been waiting. This is the thing that I've been waiting for all my life. I'm a believer now. I, hope we, I think we'll see him in heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. Has God given you a new name? If you are born again, and you are truly born again, God has given you a new name. We sing that song. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Amen. Now, the stones. In fact, let me do this. Back in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. What does white represent in Scripture? Yeah, every, everybody says the same thing. Number one, you can go back to Genesis 1. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. Okay, universally, light is good, darkness is evil. You can sometimes, when you are with certain people, you can see, you can almost see the darkness in them. You can almost feel the darkness in them, and you know that things aren't right. 
But I guarantee you, when people get around you and you're right with God, they can see the light coming out of you. And that's what draws them to you. They want to hear what you have to say. They want to know what it is that you know because you've got light coming out of you. You're, and in Revelation 19, uh, look over there very quickly. Revelation 19. Study colors in the Bible. White, red, blue, purple, black. They all have meaning to them. Uh, in Revelation 19, oh, let's see here. Yeah, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's how the King James renders it. The NIV, the New King James, and others say the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints. That's a lie. That's a blatant, outright lie. That's telling you that you, by your own righteousness, will get to wear a white robe because you've done good things. And that's not true, is it? No, it's totally not true. Very far from the truth. All the works of righteousness are as what? Filthy rags in God's sight. So anyway, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So white represents purity, represents cleanliness. It represents things that are clean, things that have been sanctified. Though your, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Remember the hair of Jesus when John saw him. And he said the hairs of his head were white like wool, white as snow. Why? Because the sins of mankind were laid upon the head of the sacrifice by the high priest, Brother George. Symbolized by the crown of thorns that they beat into his head. And now that Jesus is past Calvary, which means he has done the work that God sent him to do, to provide the forgiveness of every man's sins, he no longer has the crown of thorns on his head, the sins of mankind on his head. That's why his hairs were white like wool as snow. All going back to Isaiah. I love that. Amen, I love that. Now, um, so the white represents purity. The stone, think about that. What do stones represent in the Bible? Turn to Exodus 28, and as you're turning there, give me a story in the Bible that has a, a significant stone or a rock in it. Huh? The millstone. Yeah, yeah. And so there is a, there's a neat thing about that, Chris. And I wish I knew it. No, I'm just kidding. In Jeremiah 51, after God had given Jeremiah all the prophecies against Babylon, he said, write them all down. So he wrote them all down. Then God said, take a stone and wrap those prophecies around that stone, and ca a big stone, and cast that into the river Euphrates. <laughs> So he did. And God said, that's how I'm going to destroy Babylon. It's going to be boom, just like that. You see the same thing in Revelation 18. An angel took a great big, I think it was a millstone, and cast it into the sea. <laughs> big wave comes up. And he said, that's how I'm going to destroy Babylon. So he says that concerning those who have who I think is offend one of these little ones, children. It would be better for him that a stone be hung about his neck and be cast into the sea. God, Jesus, is giving that person the same judgment that he's giving Babylon. Okay? Jaden, another story with a stone in it. You had your hand raised, got to come up with one. Do what? 
I can't hear him. No, you have to do better than that. Yeah. That rock was Christ. Okay. He's smitten the first time because that's Christ's first coming. He was smitten of men. That's why Moses smote him and the rivers of life came out from him. But when Jesus comes the second time, he's not coming to be smitten, is he? And that's what got Moses in trouble. Very good one. Yes, yeah, somebody else. Yeah, the stone stuck in Goliath's head. He receives in his forehead a permanent mark. <laughs> okay? Um, let's see. Oh, saved by the bell. Let me, let me read this one. Let me, let me get this one out and we, so I can move on next Sunday. Exodus 28, 26. Thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make. This is for Aaron the high priest. And shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of, of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, there's the color, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron, watch this. See, on every stone, it was a different type of stone, and these were precious stones, like jasmine and emerald, things like that. Upon every stone was written the name of a tribe of Israel. They would engrave it into the stone and then place that stone as a signet in the breastplate that Aaron wore. And Aaron was to strap this breastplate on when he went in on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of Israel for one year. And it says, verse 29, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And I remember reading this and I started crying because he had our names on his heart when he made himself the sacrifice for our sins. Mm. It's like he was saying, this is for Mike. This is for Gary. This is for Melissa. This is for Dee. This is for Helen. And all of the names that Christ knew, he knows everybody's name. He has them on his heart when he becomes the sacrifice for man's sins. Mm, 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 mm. I love that. Let's go to prayer. Father, bless your word. We thank you for it. Lord, you're such a beautiful God. Thank you, God, for remembering me when you come into your kingdom. Thank you, God, for having our names on your heart and also the names of Israel on your heart. When you died on the cross, you were dying for them. You were dying for us. And Father, we can't thank you enough for doing what you did for us. Thank you, God. Thank you for this word. We ask you to bless it now. Bless your people today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.